Welcome to Conscious Compassion, hosted by Charles Gray and Laura Darrell. This podcast will share stories of the different ways that people deal with low moments in their lives. How they manifest the drive to overcome obstacles and keep pushing forward. A fluid space with media, poetry, music, literary readings, or just plain storytelling. Coupled with in-depth interviews of the storytellers so that listeners can learn, relate, and be inspired. Spend a moment with us as we explore creative coping strategies for these chaotic times. Conscious Compassion. Where Where we we share share because because we care. Welcome to Conscious Compassion. This is Charles Gray. And I'm Laura Darrell. And today we have Andrew Forstoffel, who is a highly accredited um, author and amazing spirit. This man's uh, journey, story, I don't even know where to start. I had the great fortune to do a theatrical production that was based on his book. Um, and I'm going to let him tell you about it because I don't want to mess it up. (laughs) (laughs) So Andrew, why don't you just let people know about, about passing and not about passing through about walking to listen, um, your book and at least give them that to work with. And then we can start talking about more specifically your story. Great. Great. Thank you both so much for having me. Yeah. Really honored and excited to be here. Um, so yeah, my, my book is about a year that I spent walking across the United States <clears throat> right after I graduated from college. And it details the outer journey of that experience and the inner journey. Um, it's called Walking to Listen. And, and uh, I had a sign on my backpack that, that said Walking to Listen. And, and the whole walk was inspired by what felt like kind of a gaping hole in my understanding of myself and of my culture. And and I had completed my education and and yet still had all these questions about who I was and, and what I was doing here on planet earth. And I decided that rather than pretend I had more certainty than I did and knew more than I did to actually just let my need lead, you know, and my need was, who am I? And um, I don't think I knew it at the time, but I I think I had a really profound need, and I would say still do, to connect with people and to connect with the diversity of people um, with different perspectives on growing up and on living life. And um, I had sort of existed in a bubble or or, or just various bubbles up to that point in my life. And and now that I had graduated, I I was kind of just like, um, yeah, I've got to like, th- I've got to dive into the abyss. And um, what I began to find on that journey, um, I-, I love that the name of this show is Conscious Compassion. And, and um, again, I-, I wasn't really conscious <laughs> when I set out on this walk of what all I was committing to. But what I can see now, the walk was 10 years ago. Um, I I can see now that what I was committing to was essentially like at the, at the essence uh, of what I was doing was committing to myself and committing to be able to somehow be with myself, no matter how rainy it got or how hot it got or how lonely I got or how terrified I got or how full of doubt or angry or self-loathing, you know, like all of those mind states that we are all going through to various degrees and in various ways every day, the walk was kind of like a, a microscope, you know, and all the time I had alone walking on the road um, and not knowing where I was going to sleep at night um, and, and, and putting myself in a position uh I was going to say putting myself in a position of need, but really I think it, it was putting myself in a position that prohibited me or prevented me from forgetting that I'm always in a state of need. You know, every one of us is constantly in need of something. If only the next gulp of air, you know, we're all, we're these needy, beautiful, needy human, human beings. And, and that's not a weakness that's, 
the source of our, I, th I think it's the source of our connection to, to our power, which, and our power, our power is in our interconnectedness, you know? We need each other, we need the elements we, we need. And the walk began to reveal this truth to me. Um, and but it was a, a uniquely a unique way to go it, about it, and yeah. and you were a unique person to be able to do it. Yes. Because I mean, let's let's. It's one of the things that I think became a theme for us as actors doing your story. Was it became very quickly evident that if you looked different, this could never have happened. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, uh, I was just thinking about as a girl, if I would have the guts to do because yeah. I, I went backpacking around Europe with a mm -hmm. friend um, back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And there were some situations where if I hadn't had a male companion, mm -hmm. um, I, and, and I know girls who do it. So I'm I'm not saying like it's impossible. I know girls who are brave and do it and they don't even think about it. But um, but I got into some scrapes that I, I was mm. so glad I had a guy to be like, well, this is my boyfriend. And yes. <laughs> and he wasn't yeah. my boyfriend. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did that ever cross your mind or, or and like, were you ever scared or worried? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it did cross my mind. Um, I'm white. I present as straight. And I look like, you know, yeah, I look like your, your everybody's sort of, favorite nephew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your, your average hetero dude, uh, white dude. And, and, and I was, I became aware of those sort of like socialized identities in, in a way that I just frankly hadn't been before this, before this walk, sort of being far away from anyone I knew and far away from any kind of place that was familiar to me. Yeah. I began, I began to feel vulnerable in a way that I, that I hadn't before. And, you know, the identities I was walking with, um, afforded me privilege in the sense of, um, you know, the thoughts that crossed your mind on, on your journey, on your trip, um, didn't stick in, in my mind, in the way that they would have probably if I were a man of color or if I were um, existing on the sort of far, the marginalized end of the, of the spectrum of identity. Um, and I think it's so important for us hetero white dudes to find ourselves in lived experiences of, of what it's like to kind of be out there um, and sort of like vul vulnerable and, and in need of the environment that we find ourselves walking through or the, or the people we find ourselves encountering. Um, and that's, I mean, I, I actually, I don't know, I hesitate to make grand sweeping statements about what other people need, but, but I, I can say that I needed that experience to begin waking me up to it's sort of like the invisible and unconscious privilege that I was carrying and then to learn about, okay, I was born into this body and into this sort of cultural societal story. And what is, what is the like maximal way for me to sort of flex whatever power I do have. And what I began to find is that at least for me, it had to do with, offering people the fullness of my presence, um, which may sound, I don't know how it sounds, maybe it sounds arrogant or narcissistic. It's like, well, the, the best thing you could do with your power is like give people your presence, you know, but let me explain it a little bit. It's like slowing down enough to see clearly through my own projections and assumptions about who that person is to slow down enough and, and to do enough inner work in myself to see through the haze of my illusions about other people, to, to actually see through to the heart of who they truly are. And we live in a society where people kind of aren't really doing that a whole lot, you know, not at all. taking yeah. time to really see the divine in each person, actually. We're not rewarded for that. We're rewarded yeah. for ranking each other on quickly. social media and yeah. judging each yes. other quickly. And yeah. right. Yes. You, assess, you learn to assess people, right. you, you categorize them, you, you 
you give them your own set of this is this is this is what you are yeah and therefore this is how i'm going to treat you right. or this is how much attention i'm going to give to you yeah whereas um your amazing <laughs> openness really is about seeing each individual person and and being open to to whatever it is that they have to offer mm -hmm. and and not not putting up those judgments in front i mean i think I know it sounds silly, but it, it, it was profound for me. I, one of the things that mm. I will never forget, um, we finished the first performance when you all, you and your mother came to the show. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, being new to the show, I mean, it, it had had a number of iterations prior to that particular production. So I was new to the mm -hmm. whole thing. And I didn't know you. I didn't know anything about you, honestly, before the show. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, there was a lot of excitement. Oh, wow. You know, Andrew and his mom are coming and everything. And I, all I could think was, Lord, I don't know what he's going to think. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is, it's so strange to do a show with the person being not just alive, but, you know, there. Um, and, you know, I didn't carry the weight of, of Max or anything. I wasn't playing you, thank goodness. But <laughs> there was, you know, a lot, a lot weighing on it. And, um, when I came out into the lobby, you know, you just looked me dead in the eyes. And the first thing you said was, can I give you a hug? And I was like, mm. hell yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was just like, <laughs> okay. But it, it completely disarmed everything. Mm. All the concern, all the nervousness, mm -hmm. all the, oh, gee, I hope they liked it, all of mm -hmm. the others, all of the stuff that could have been, mm -hmm. um, and the posturing that I think I was mentally prepared for, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, you are, you are the author, you are the, you are the everything. Um, <laughs> you yeah, are the right. everything. Yeah. Well, I am the everything. But, but, but you know what I'm talking <laughs> yeah. about. I, yeah, like, sure. If, if you go into a, like a New York situation, the first time you're, you're, you're the you're, reason the show's happening. So you're, you're a exactly. big deal. Well, one you know, of the and, and yeah. if, if you're in reasons. like these bigger productions in New York or something, it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the author. It can be, it can, or the subject matter. It can be a producer. Producer. It could be anybody who's kind of high on yeah. the totem pole. Was yeah. that something you learned on that trip? Or because I come from a New England family um, upbringing and very loving, kind, supportive people. But the instinct to just, I mean, I think I'm a, actually a pretty huggy person. But mm -hmm. to, to, um, to just say, can I give you a hug? I was just thinking to myself, mm -hmm. would I do that to complete mm -hmm. strangers? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, I think old enough to be his dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think in the moment, I don't, you know, I think in the moment I was just so overwhelmed by the whole experience of seeing Charles and this crew of beautiful people dedicate their lives for a, a number of months and some of them longer to making the story that I lived into this work of art. And so I was, I was just so overwhelmed. And I think one, one of the ways I am is, is, uh, like I'm not very, I, well, on my good days, I tend not to be very good at pretending, you know, to be something other than what I am. And, and I have bad days where I get good at pretending, you know, to be something, <laughs> something else. But, um, I think that day in particular, I was just so blown away and blown open by the whole thing that, uh, my body just it. wanted to hug your body, Charles, you know, it's just like, <laughs> I yo, I can't, I just I gotta, I, like, and, and there's also that thing too of like, we're only alive for a short amount of time here. And, uh, how do I want to, how do I want to be in this body and in this life? And touch is a big part of it for me, like physical touch and, and expressing yeah. affection and, and respect in that way. And, and then also just the invisible touch of, of listening and and of of receiving being listened to it's like i want to live in that intimate in that intimacy um and that is that is a risk and each one of us de depending on the identities we've been born into and our family of origins and our histories each one of us is going to risk something unique in opening up to a life of intimacy and vulnerability and mm -hmm. for me you know what do i risk when i when I choose to let my heart love in the way that it was born to, um, 
what makes it hard for me to do that. Um, I'm still finding out, but I mean, I, I was thinking about this show and like what, you know, where, where did my path, where did I begin like walking the path of, of conscious compassion and, and uh, compassion, I think means etymologically, I think it means like to suffer together or like to suffer with or something like that. And so I think suffering is at the root of compassion and, and the extent to which I've suffered myself consciously is the extent to which I can extend compassion to others who are suffering and everyone's suffering. You know, some of us are just able to <clears throat> hide it and, and pretend better than others. Um, some of us are just more functional, you know, than the people we see out on the street shouting at the clouds. <clears throat> but That's my... That's some days. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's hard out here. <laughs> And so for me, yeah, I, I mean, I, this, is in the, this is in the musical, it's in the book. And uh, when I was writing the book, it, I sort of uncovered this. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I think I began my walk the summer my parents got divorced when I was 15 years old. Like I actually, I started walking. I took my first step when I was 23 years old after college, but in tracing the causality when I was writing the book, like, why did I actually do this? Like, I kind of came around to that mega wound, you know, that I, that I sustained and experienced um, when I was 15, very traumatic and messy and disorienting and confusing and everything I thought was real. I didn't, I didn't know anymore. I didn't know what was real. I didn't know what, what I could trust or, or um, what it meant to, what it meant to be me. You know, uh, my identity was so, um, wrapped up in the family structure that had existed in my life for 15 years up to that point. And, um, and so I think that wound, and there were surely others before, but, but I see, I see that one as the sort of origin story, you know, like the beginning of all of my questions and, and, and these questions coming from like, we're probably not going to ask ourselves questions about reality and existence and identity if we're super comfortable, <laughs> you know, like if, if I'm like in the hot tub and I'm just like, this is great. I'm like, I'm not asking myself questions about who am I and why is it, you know, and what matters, or what matters, you know, I'm like it's, it's when, th it's when I'm out in the cold or it's when I'm hungry right. or it's when I just got punched in the face that I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> you know, the questions yeah. start to come in and those questions lead to some extraordinary journeys. And each one of us is, is on that journey. It's called our life, you know? Um, yeah. So I'm curious, if I can. W yes, the show very much focused on on um, angst with you and the divorce and you and your father and all of that. But you, you ended up in a very different place, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, um, by the end of writing this book than you did when you started. So my question, I guess, is what life traumas have come in mm. since mm. you achieved mm. at least mm. a certain level of enlightenment <laughs> yeah. um, that yeah. still presented a real challenge for you and how were you able to use that information to get through it? Mm. Mm. So grateful for your... Penetrating question, Charles. Yeah, that's, I, I would, <laughs> I would love, truly, I mean, it's so rare you would get someone asking me just directly about, you know, the, the traumas um, that I've lived and curious in this moment about like, what would our world look like if we had the courage to ask each other those questions and, and be asked? Um, so appreciate the opportunity to live in that world right now with you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, you know, one, one, the first thing that comes to mind is um, some work I've been doing recently um, with somatics and um, using the body or, or just recognizing that, that the body um, stores the energy of trauma in it if, if we don't allow it to release and move and, um, and do whatever it has to do to shake off that trauma. And... And that these energetic blockages or patterns in the body, we, like we can't always know where they come from and they, they may very well be sort of a, a conglomeration of 
of countless little things, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm aware of that and, and I'm aware of the sort of the mundane violations that we accept as sort of normal or as part of daily life, you know, the, mun- the mundane violations, the little, the little traumas that actually count, you know, like being ignored or um, driving in a car, <laughs> you know, like our, our, in some ways, like our society is laid down on a foundation of uh, that necessitates disrespect, like the pace at which we run and the conveniences we have come to expect and just kind of the, the, the way we operate here necessitates a sort of in, indignity and, and, and disrespect for, for human life. And I'm not talking just about, you know, the people who are taking out our garbage for a living, but I'm, I'm talking about all of us. Um, so those traumas aside, you know, if, if you're asking me about particular life events. Do those traumas, those stem from, um, you know, because maybe I'm just hearing my grandmother in my head right now, just like not not being raised with manners. Like, I mean, because some of those things that you just mentioned, like driving in a in a in a considerate way. And mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> what was the other one? Um I've already <laughs> being ignored, yeah. being, being ignored, um, just being like, you know, I think of in New York sometimes just people's mm-hmm. lack of spatial awareness. Yeah. And I just think, well, maybe nobody told them. And so mm-hmm. they, they just don't mm-hmm. care. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I, th- yes, I think, I think what I'm speaking about is like, that, and that's a great example. It's like, they never learned about the profundity of their own value and their own sanctity without and and without that knowing without knowing themselves as nothing less than sacred and 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 treasurable and cherished without knowing themselves and not in the not not, i think not in a narcissistic way and we, we become narcissistic when we don't know ourselves as as sacred and cherishable and priceless and and so not knowing that about themselves, they are naturally un- unable to understand that about other people. Yep. And so yep. therefore treat other people like objects. Um, and so that's, that's a trauma, not only for the people who are being related to in that way, but for, for the person who is ignorant to the, the sanctity of life. Um, hasn't been taught self-respect. I mean, self-respect that's is... How, that's what they've been taught. They, they've been taught that by their parents. You know, they've been taught that the yeah. way to prove your essence, to prove your 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 worth, yeah. is basically by belittling everybody around you. Because the yeah. fact that you can do it and get away with it yeah. sets you apart. And that's what makes yeah. you special. Yeah. That yep. translates into power. Um, and then it is all about suppression and oppression as opposed to mm-hmm. viewing yourself as part of the mass because they don't ever want to be viewed as that. Mm-hmm. They consider that to be common, mm-hmm. you know? Right, yes. Um, you, they would never, ever, ever want to be compared yeah. to someone that they consider to be beneath them. And yes. they're forever ranking other individuals, you know, whether or not they're even worth their time. I've had... <laughs> unfortunate conversations with people where I thought, I thought we were communing as, as two mm. equals and just sharing information. And somewhere very casually mm-hmm. in the conversation, they would make a statement along the lines of, you know, um, you know, you're really lucky that, that uh, I'm taking the time to talk to you like this because mm. I don't usually, I don't usually bother mm. with, with, with people. But, you know, in your case, I'm going to make an exception. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What do you say to that? Yeah. It's like Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's and, I think it's yeah, I mean just to jump in on 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 that <laughs> on that it's it's like we we could only relate to another person with with such ignorance if we are unaware of the the deeper truths about who we are and 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 what I'm referring to when I say that is we don't when when we don't understand and 
and get to live in relationship with our essential interconnectedness here, not only with each other, but with the earth. And, and this society is one in which um, we have created systems that allow for us to live sort of out of relationship uh, with the earth, the elements, and all, all the relatives we have here, animal, plant, mineral, human. And, and so there's sort of this like, un, I think unconscious to most of us because it's the water we're swimming in. It's like the fish, the fish isn't aware of the water it's swimming in because it's just everywhere. But, but we are swimming in, in waters of profound disconnection. And so I think there is just sort of this um, unavoidable trauma that, that we experience just simply living in New York City or in Portland, mm-hmm. Maine, where I am right now. You know, like... L- I'm just, near Portland, Maine. <laughs> you're in Portland, Maine right now? I'm, I'm not far. I'm in Yarmouth. Oh, my, no way. <laughs> that's just, amazing. That's neat. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, cool. not to derail you. That's but... <laughs> fun. <laughs> no, let's find these little connections, you know? Things Connection. Dry. Yes, yes. <laughs> Anyways, so I, I, I don't I don't exactly know where I'm going with that, but just wanting to like <clears throat> wanting to you know, I, I think just back to your question again, Charles, like I I I, I wanna find out what our society would become if if each of us um were brave enough to accept that we are carrying within our bodies just by virtue of being born into this dysfunctional society, this beautiful and dysfunctional society, uh, traumas, ancestral traumas and in- environmental traumas and spiritual traumas. And uh, to each of us begin setting about the task of coming to just get in relationship with, with those wounds, not try to get rid of them or even heal them necessarily, but just first begin to become aware of them and, that's something I'm still doing now. I mean, I, I, um, you know, the, the ways that I do that now aren't so much by walking long distances, although (laughs) I do, you know, I, I do get in some long walks here and there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's more, more in, in conscious circles and ceremonies and, uh, just healing spaces where, where people are entering the room with an intention to check in on themselves and risk, um, being seen as they find out a little bit more about who they are and what they're carrying, you know, um, this, yeah. So I'm, so in, in, in my, in, in, in the ways that I'm continuing that work in, in ceremony and in circle, I am, yeah, I'm finding, I mean, I can tell you one story here just again to, to give you, I, I want to be sure I don't like leave this question without giving you a, a personal example. I don't want to e- evade, you know? Um, okay. I had, uh, I had an experience that, that came to mind, um, last spring sort of unexpectedly doing some healing work with a friend and she, was doing some body work on me and came to my back and kind of like the back of my heart. Um, you can just sort of feel the vulnerability of that in your own body right now, like feel into like the back of your heart, you know, (laughs) and your back. And, uh, um, it's like, you can't quite see what's behind there. And, um, it's just this sort of soft spot. And she, she noticed that something was going on there. Um, and, she just asked me, is anything coming to mind right now? And this memory of being at the circus when I was like two or three years old and uh, one of the acts had finished and I turned to the little boy next to me and he looked at me and smiled and then pushed me backward and I fell down dropped behind the bleachers, you know, six or seven feet and hit the ground and don't remember much after that. But this memory resurfaced and and it wasn't something I had, like I knew it had had happened, but I had never really like felt that and um, let the body, and you know, we may have 
judgments i'm like noticing a judgment come in right now in myself of like dude that's not even like that's not like trauma like grow up you know like that's 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 like get to the varsity leagues and 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 stop like complaining about like something that wasn't even that bad but that's mind like what did the body experience in that moment and what my body experienced for the first time ever in that moment was I'm not safe. Like mm-hmm. that was that was what the body experienced. Like I didn't even realize that um, that I was vulnerable in the way that I realized I was in that moment. Um, I'm yeah. not safe. It's possible to be betrayed. Like um, at any moment, like anything could happen where where the floor drops and I start and I start falling. You know, and other other humans can't be trusted. You know, and so this got lodged in my body and began informing my my understanding of reality you know so and how you interacted with others potentially right 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 wow yeah as far as um listening because when i think of listening i mean it's so obviously important to listen we're told that in acting that's actually Mm. acting 101 is we it needs to be clear that you're actually hearing what somebody saying to you and you're reacting off of that you're not just Mm -hmm. blah 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 my line blah 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 Mm -hmm. and i think about that in terms of good parenting like it's so important Mm -hmm. to to listen but then what do you say to the people who then you know when the toddler's screaming or somebody's reacting in a really unhealthy way and and listening it's not that listening is the problem but rewarding that behavior Mm -hmm. becomes Mm -hmm. an issue what what do you say to that? Is that a misinterpretation or misread of the situation or what should what should happen in a situation that's that volatile and hard to mm. pin down? Or or at least you're you're unsure of whether you should keep uh-huh. keep rewarding it with your attention? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, I think the first thing I have to say is just I bow down to all the parents in the world right now, you know, who are walking this path of living with children and um, entering into that crucible. I don't have kids myself. So, you know, anything I say in response to this will, will, will be coming from kind of a fundamentally uninformed Mm -hmm. place. (laughs) But you know, Um, I use that as a metaphor, uh but it goes beyond that in terms of societal listening. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I guess what I'll say is when someone is, I, I think of uh, my mentor, um, a Navajo man named Daryl Slim, and um, he, he taught me that, you know, when someone is speaking to him disrespectfully in ceremony or, or on the street, when someone is, is sort of bringing violence of some kind in, into the scene, he says, uh, he says that all they're, all they're doing is asking for help in a funny way. And that's what I say to them. That's a funny way of asking for help. Um, so mm. for me, what I try to do is remember that and remain aware that um, when someone is in a state of health and wholeness, there's no need to, to react with bitterness or cruelty you know, that they, they're knowing themselves, they feel whole, they feel healthy, they feel they belong, they, they feel seen, they feel heard. And, and so there's, so compassion is the natural, is, is what they leave naturally in their wake, you know? So when someone is acting in a different way, I try to remember that it's an indication of their sickness right now. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a symptom of, of a disease they're going through in the mind or in the body, or it's, or it's a wound that they're unaware of. Um, and, or, or that they're, you know, maybe somewhat aware of, but haven't received the help they need, the support they need. And I, yeah, I struggle with that. Cause when I, when you walk with that perspective, it's hard not to <laughs> like see everyone as a sort of, yeah, traumatized and, and right, diseased individual praying praying crying begging for help which i am we are you know um 
And so where is the, where is the, how do you hold that awareness? You know, um, I know in, in Buddhism, they talk about the quality of equanimity and, uh, how you need this quality of equanimity to ground your awareness of suffering, which is where your compassion comes from. And so the equanimity of like, yeah, I see you, you know? And so to your question, I think for me, when I'm encountering something like that, it's just a question of how do I see this person clearly? Um, Cause you know, when I see someone else's suffering, a lot of times it'll bring up judgments in me of them. Right. Right. And those yep. judgments are coming from the place where I'm either unresolved in my own healing mm-hmm. um, and I'm projecting something onto them or the where I'm reaching the limit of my ability to listen and provide space and and witnessing. And so for me, it's just a dance of, you know, help me see this person clearly and at the same time put myself where I need to be and stay where where I need to be in order to remain authentic and true and basically not giving something that I don't have. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's live every time, certainly no formula um, and kind of like improv, which I haven't done, but I imagine it's a bit like, you know, yep. like we're all kind of improv trying to do our best yep. to show up to people and failing along the way and learning as we go, you know? So is there a technique that helps you get into Isn't that natural though? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It is natural. Is there a technique that gets you into listening or when you when you're struggling with that, when you're struggling with um, maybe something internally that you're you're having trouble relating or. Yeah. um, When when a situation comes up that you can feel the resistance in the walls Mm. starting to build, how Mm. do you Mm. how do you dismantle them? Mm. Well, I mean, first again got to lead with just being real like I don't always you know like sometimes it's just a wall and I'm like I (laughs) this is just here and uh and I'm not interested in dismantling it right now like I gotta I gotta get to that meeting or whatever so there's the pain of that and the reality of that in me um and then there are just moments where I you know sometimes just by grace and and when I'm getting my needs met, I think that's, that's probably the first thing. The first concrete thing I would say is like, I'm learning that it's really important that I am attuned with my needs, my physical needs, my emotional needs, my spiritual needs, and that I'm doing what I can to get those met so that I can authentically be there uh, for someone else. Be there for someone else. Cause if I'm, if I'm starving, I can't feed someone, you know, that's like caregiving 101. Yeah. Right. You know, if you've ever had to take care of somebody who was, mm. you know, just literally couldn't do anything for themselves. Yeah. And the first thing that every doctor, every hospital, every support system will tell you is that you have to take care of yourself first. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because otherwise you can't possibly be there for someone else. It's, it's what they say um, on the airplanes. It's what RuPaul preaches from the pulpit. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it yeah. keeps coming but up. It's true. Yes. It, it, it ab- absolutely true. You know, you have to be. You have to be there for yourself so that you will have the energy uh, to be there for someone else. I Sorry, I have been absent for so much of this. <laughs> My internet has just been hell. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Normally, it's actually absolutely fine, but yeah, um, yeah. I have missed more than I care to. Um, back to the world of pointed questions, and I apologize in advance. <laughs> oh, all good. Bring it on. Um so, you know, life is life. Yeah. And it happens to all of us. And that is that is the the big universal connector. Um, and no matter how how piously or perfectly one one lives it, you're still going to get slapped in the face with some stuff because that's just the way life works. And I guess I'm wondering what how you handle things when something hits you that puts you completely off kilter. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of another, another line. My mentor, Daryl, um, shares a lot with me, uh, is, is just this phrase, touch and listen, touch and listen. And so <clears throat> when something throws me completely off kilter, there's, there's the pain of that, but then there's the 
compounded pain of resisting it, you know? And so I think when, and I mean, I can give you a concrete example. I, I this fall and this winter were, were really hard for me in ways that I kind of haven't experienced before. Just feeling, I made a move, a, a geographical move and, um, to Maine? To Maine, yeah. And and was just feeling transplant shock and confusion and depression and mm -hmm. what am I doing with my life and how am I going to freaking pay my rent and what have I been investing myself in? My path has been largely a sort of pathless path and I'm like, wait, have I been just like sitting on my ass the last <laughs> year? Like, what am I doing? You know, like, you show me the evidence, <laughs> produce something. Where's your resume? Ah, just this like really intense voice just like rising in my mind and and it's a lot of fear and, and um, shame and just, yeah, it, it was it was a hard winter for me and the, what else could I do? What else can I do when, when these things come, but be willing to touch and listen, to, to feel it, to know it, to open myself to it and um, not sort of like passively accept or kind of like, like helplessly surrender, but sort of with, with will and, and, and the remembrance that my own experiencing of these things connects me to every single human who's ever lived, you know, be willing, willing to feel this and know this part of existence also. And so that I think, and to trust that the wound is the medicine. It's a, that's another Daryl line. Um, Daryl Slim, y'all. Shameless plug for my, my teacher, Daryl. Um, I love Daryl. <laughs> yes, me too. So, so many. Um, the wound is the medicine he, he shared with me once. And so when I am wounded, when I get wounded, may I remember, even in the midst of the agony or the confusion or the darkness, that somewhere in here, if only I can be willing to not turn away from it, not ignore it, but, but really enter into the waters of it fully and feel that, that somewhere in that experience and in that relationship is medicine for me. Mm -hmm. That, that is not only going to enlighten me and illuminate me and integrate and, and make me whole by my willingness to know it, but serve others in some way. Do you think we resist? Because uh, I I'm I've had a moment not too long ago that was precisely like what you're describing. And is it is it the need to fix, and the we don't want to sit in it because yeah. it feels like we're not doing anything practical to fix the problem. We're just kind of sitting mm -hmm. in our own you know dirty yeah. bath water is what we or that's how we uh, that's how our twisted minds yeah. see it. Mm -hmm. I, because yeah. I wonder why it's so hard to sit there mm -hmm. and and see the wound as medicine. Yeah, yeah, we're not. It's definitely not a perspective most of us grew up with, and most of us grew up with with quite the contrary perspective, which says a wound is weakness, and a wound yeah. is shameful, yeah. and mm -hmm. and a wound is evidence of of of, of you not of, doing it right. Of you're not doing it right, and you failed. Yeah. So damn, that's a, that's a freaking wound right there that, that, that requires some healing, you know? Um, and we can't do it alone is the other thing I was going to say is like when I'm in my dirty bathwater and just in it, um, there's, there's this additional wound we have to heal, most of us in this society, that, of, of, iso of isolating ourselves, you know, of, uh, of what we're talking about here. And, and so finding a way to reach out to people to be witnessed in our suffering and be seen and be helped, you know, is, is something that's, it's, it's essential, you know, it's like mm -hmm. the image that came to mind as, as you were saying, this is the, the, the metaphor of birth, a mother giving birth or of any one of us dying, you know, is as we go through those processes, there's nothing anyone can do to like do it for us. And there's no fixing it and there's no stopping it. There's only a good midwife or a good doula who 
or, or a good birth companion or death companion who, who, who know, who has some information about how to facilitate the process, but isn't so deluded to think that, that, that they're in charge of the process or can, or can, or should do anything to stop it. No, no, no. Birth has an intelligence, intelligence of its own through the body and knows how to do this thing. Death has an intelligence of its own and knows how to do this thing through the body. And so bringing that kind of perspective to the many births and deaths and rebirths that we go through over the course of our lives, which feel like traumas, which feel disorienting and terrifying. If only we can remember that, oh, there's something, there's a cycle happening here of a, of a death and a birth. And may I surround myself with people who, who know how to simply just hold my hand and rub my back, mm, you know? Wow. And, oh. Yeah. And just respect the process and not, yeah, just don't get your fingers in it. Let me go through this. I ne- I'm dying right now. Let me die. Let me go through this thing, you know, yeah. or I'm giving birth to this new me. Like, ah, help just be with me as I, as I howl, you know, and relationships. And I feel like a lot of that comes around to faith and trust mm. because yeah. when you're, when, especially when you're talking about, say, being in a new place and feeling like your life's not going anywhere and then the self-inflicted wounds yeah. that we put on ourselves, mm-hmm. just beating ourselves up that, you know, I'm not doing enough, mm-hmm. I'm not doing what I should be doing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, a big part of that while you're wallowing in it yes. is just trusting yes. that this isn't the end. This is just part of the process yes, yes. that there is going to be another, yes. <laughs> another page. Yes. The page will turn, yeah. the chapter will end, yeah. and then there will be another one. And, but you have yes. to get through that part of it. But trusting in that yes. and while I'm is wallowing, so wallow. hard. Yeah. Yes. While, yes. while, while yes. I'm in the mud, like be in the mud. Right. And and don't feel like you have to. Yeah. You will you will eventually reinvent yourself. Yeah. And because that that in itself, that process of of the trauma of feeling awful in that moment yeah. is in itself a little mm. rebirth. Yeah. Because you are going to come out of it a different person. Yeah. yeah. It just takes, it, it does take a village and it does, it does. take the right village because yes. it takes the people who, who do understand, the people who are not going to tell you to fix it yes. because it makes them uncomfortable. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, you need to be with people who, who see it for what it mm-hmm. is and who are just going to be there for you, mm-hmm. genuinely mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. you yeah. and support you. And if you don't have that support, trying to fix figure out how to find that within yourself. And that Mm -hmm. is a level of reflection that is, that can be really frightening. Mm. I think so Mm. many people have a hard time doing that though. And, and, and it usually is ironically the people who love us most Mm because the people who love us most hate seeing us in pain. Right. They don't want to sit there. They they want to fix the problem. Right. I understand that. And, but uh, they had to go through it and you're going to have to go through it and everybody else is going to have to go through <laughs> yeah, it. Nice. And yeah. at some point, you just have to learn how to, to recognize it. And sometimes that, that can be the hard part as well, you know, because we don't... Uh, yeah, learn to recognize We have it. so many different ways <laughs> that we um, kind of push it off and try not to acknowledge it ourselves and try not to accept it ourselves. So we start taking it out on everything mm-hmm. and everybody yes. around us. And when somebody's coming at you with that kind of energy, it's hard mm-hmm. sometimes to see mm-hmm. that they are... Mm-hmm they are in that cocoon stage mm. and you know and it's just starting to crack mm. and mm. they're not happy about it <laughs> and, yes. and you got to figure out you know mm. oh that's what's going on yes all yeah. right now you have a choice now you yeah. get to have that that emotional moment of do i help this person yeah. through it yeah, yeah, yeah. or do i just go i'll check in with you in a couple of weeks <laughs> You know? That's so good. Because it's just a very real thing, oh, you know. It's so like good. I just do I want to go through yes, that right yeah. now? Because maybe that's not where yeah, I am. Or maybe that's like, mm, yeah. no, you know what? Mm-hmm. For for me to stay in my happy place, yeah. I need to give you some space. Oh, I love that, Charles. I love that. So. That's that I feel your your wisdom. 
Yeah. Well, thank you. It's... Do you feel, Andrew, like it's a little bit of yin and yang, though? Because, I, you know, just to play devil, I don't know if it's devil's advocate, but mm -hmm. just to... I, I feel like the energy of holding space is so important and being mm -hmm. able to listen and not try to fix. On the other hand, it does hit a point where mm -hmm. you can wallow for too long. And who? Mm -hmm. I guess my question would be, who but the one who is wallowing would know that. when too long is too long? And I think that's that's the, that's the challenge of being a witness and a companion to someone who's who's hurting is or who's wallowing is no matter what I might think or judge about this person's process in the end, only they know, right. only they know what they need and when they need it on like their soul is sovereign and I'm not the author of their soul. I don't, I don't know. Right. I don't know what, what they're here to do. I don't know their destiny, their karma, their, their, their medicine. And, and and so it does take trust. It does take trust, you know. And yeah, um, trusting. I totally this get person. that. Yeah, this person. We bad. had a whole section of in another interview where it was about uh, the parameters of grieving, mm. you know, and and the fact that there there is no one way or right way to grieve, and no one mm. has the right to tell you when you when, when you've enough. achieved it. Right. Yes. you know, when it's when enough is enough. You know, there's there's it's going to last for as long as it's going to last right. with right. you, you know, right. and it's probably going to come back and peek and, and grab you when you mm. least expect mm -hmm. it. Right. You could be walking down the street, licking on an ice cream cone on a hot mm. sunny day, mm. couldn't be better. And then all yeah. of a sudden you see something and bam, yeah. it slaps you in the face. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that you just have to deal with in your own time. And I think similarly, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Mm. If, if you're in that moment, um, you just have to allow it to take its run its course, but you still, I think, as an observer, have to chime in when you see other things happening mm. that give you the impression that this is turning into mm. something that is mm -hmm. malignant. Yeah, and maybe and, that's maybe that sort of and going too. to like kind of turn the corner and become something else because if it's going to fester, yeah. that's not healthy. Yeah, well. Yeah, that takes skill. That takes skill to know, I think, and that's, I think, what you're bringing up, Laura, is like, you know, just the skill of engaging with someone who's in the midst of something like that. And again, just Daryl's coming in over and over again in this conversation right now. It's, he, he, he has advised me, you know, he has, he has said, spirituality is willing to listen. That's, that's all it is. Spirituality is willing to listen to whatever phenomena is arising. In, in, in my consciousness can I be willing to listen to that and so when someone appears to be turning that corner into fester mode it would be about asking them hey tell me more about that like t t tell me all about it tell me tell me every little thing you can about the choice to turn that corner what's it like and can I ask those questions non-manipulatively you know can i can i ask them really genuinely curious about wanting to know what what that's like as opposed to bringing to the questions an agenda which mm. which might disguise actually certain judgments about mm -hmm. right or wrong or and people feel that you know we know when someone's really asking us a question from a place of unknowing or whether they're right. asking a question of you know which is basically a, a judgment in disguise yeah um so Absolutely. that's a challenge it's a challenge to really that's that was enlightening i like that willing. that was good yeah be willing. <laughs> so the mentor has been big for you what about um your spirituality you said um that that's been big for you in terms of yeah absolutely uh, i mean driving easy force check-ins or y yes <laughs> yes um yeah spirituality to me i i i sort of i have undergone a sort of revolution in my own understanding of what that word refers to. Um, and I, I would say that transformation began with my walk and it's continued since certainly in my studies with Daryl and, um, and in other healing spaces that I've found myself in over the course of the years. But spirituality to me is a way of life. It's, it's, a uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not some, it's not something somewhere else. 
It's and it's not in reference to a certain something. You know, it's it's everything. It's mm. it's it's a perspective or a, a realization that I am I am this universe. Everything that I perceive and every one that I perceive is this universe. And we are mystery and we are paradox and we are sacred. And I don't know what sacred means, but I, but I know it is. And so my life then becomes an answering of the question, what, what does it mean to know myself as sacred? Um, that to me is the humbling path of spirituality because I say humbling because it, it takes me, if, if I'm genuinely attempting and endeavoring to, to really live that question, like Rilke urged us to live the question. If I'm, if I'm actually, if I give it a college try, you know, if I really give it a shot, what I'm going to find is all of those places where I'm living out, out of integrity with, with that principle, you know, it's, it's, you know, I didn't relate to uh, to the person at the DMV this morning with the kind of sanctity that they that they deserve. Uh, you know, like I, I I just didn't. I failed. Yeah, I tried. I did what I could. You know, it's humbling. It's really humbling. You know, yes. to bring that kind of attention to to the moment, to the to the dandelion, to to the box of Kleenex right here. You know, to each of you right now, to myself. So. We can only do so much. Yeah. There are so many moments where I, I am consciously trying to, I, I recognize some, a pattern. I, I'll walk into a situation. Uh, the example in this case is going to be my, my environment here. I'm, I'm in South Jersey and it is, it is fairly monochromatic. And um, so I will walk into um, one of the truck trucking and lumber supply stores or something. And I've already got this preconceived idea of who I'm going mm-hmm. to be dealing with. And I'm, and I've got to walk up to this counter and I've got to ask this person a question. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm set and I go in and I'll go in and I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to approach this with positivity. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be as pleasant and as warm and as genuine mm-hmm. as I possibly can be and see what comes at me. And sometimes, sometimes, to my great relief and surprise, I get the most <laughs> oh, genuine yeah. and warm and kind and wonderful people. But yes. then again, <laughs> there are those moments where, yeah. you know, I will start and I will come off with, and the more warm I am, mm-hmm. the more pulled back they become. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And they are, they are, yeah. uh, it's, it's almost like it's offensive to yeah. them. Like, you know, can't you just ask the question and go away? Yes. You know, they don't want, they don't want any kind of social normity, just warmth, greeting, hi, how you doing, how's your day, like none of that. Just get to the point and get out of my face. So, you know, you can only do what you can do. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's important that we try. Yes, Yes. and to not, um, you know, to not judge judge people uh, prematurely is, Mm. as you said, important because... Yeah, we we can start projecting and seeing seeing stuff that's not there. Yeah. Also, right. Yes. Or create it. You can mm-hmm. manifest mm-hmm. it because if you if you approach it with if you've got that face on that <clears throat> says, mm, I you know, yeah, <laughs> I know what you are. Yes. Then um, <laughs> they're going to give it to you. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll, it makes me think of and maybe maybe I can <clears throat> leave you all with this little story. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's from the, from both the Buddha and my dad. (laughs) So (laughs) what a combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in good, he's in good company. A little one-two punch. Because it's your dad, I'll listen. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, nice. Well, the, 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 I'll circle back around to the Buddha maybe, but I was with my, my friend a, a few years ago and, uh, he was telling me about what it's like to have his, his newborn son in his life and, one thing he said was, I can't imagine anything worse than to grow up only to have my son hate me. Mm. I can't imagine anything worse, torture, bankruptcy, like nothing worse than to have my son end up hating me. And we both looked at each other and we were like, I think we need to call our dads right now. (laughs) (laughs) And so I called my dad and um, he and I had been through 
a, a long and, and challenging and, and beautiful journey together in, in our relationship. And I had gotten to a point where I had come back around to my love for him and you would tell him, I love you. And, <clears throat> you know, um, felt less charged than it did, um, in, in the years after the divorce. And so I called him and I said, dad, I, I know, you know, I love you, but I want you to hear me say, just in case there's any doubt, I don't hate you. I don't hate you. Hmm. And he was like, um, I'm so glad to hear that. I mean, for me, of course, but honestly, mostly for you. Because for you to be walking around with that hatred or that anger or that judgment is hurting you more than anyone else, yep. you know? And so spot on. Yeah. And, and, and that's, and, and that's what the Buddha said thousands of years ago, he said something like anger Anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yep. <laughs> there you it's go. It's like, oh, so, so these, it's, it's hard because, because every day we, we encounter in ourselves and in other people indignities and violations and trespasses and ignorance and just pain, a tremendous amount of pain. And, and there is that temptation to, from in me at least, certainly, uh, to, to judge and to feel infuriated and maddened and, and just full of, to, to basically drink from the chalice, you know, uh, that poison. And I guess to just, you know, when I do, when I do find myself in judgment, to just taste it, to really feel what it feels like to, to find myself in that posture. Um, and I think in doing so, it informs us. It's like the more we pay attention to what it's like when I go on a bender, you know, the more I pay attention to, to it what feels. it actually feels like when yeah. I drink that stuff. It sucks. It's awful. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, cool. I, I, I can learn, you know, like I can learn. Um, so I don't know. That was just a story that came to mind. Um, no, it's a good one. It's a very good one because also the fact that that's not an experience you're only going to have once. Yeah, it's not a lesson that you're going to learn right, right, one right. time. Oh my god! Yeah, you're going to repeat it. Yes, and hopefully each time it's a little bit shorter. You recognize <laughs> right. it sooner. You figure out a, a way to get out of yeah. it faster. But uh, it it. We have to keep reinforcing it. Yeah. And, and the way you just said to get out of it, which I feel like I've heard echoed in so many different things, and what we've talked about this whole hour is is being aware of our feelings, like yeah. taking stock, because if we honor mm. what we're feeling and we realize that while we're being self-righteously angry about something, we feel bad, mm. then it's like, mm -hmm, well, that mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. Do I want mm -hmm. to feel bad? <laughs> yes. Do I do I want to be in this place? Because the yeah. only person who's making me go here is me. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Right. That's, that's right. power right there. That's sovereignty. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you, Andrew. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. This has God. been really, Such really wonderful. Yeah. We covered the gamut. We went everywhere. and <laughs> We, we yes. danced wild together. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Conscious Compassion. We'd love to hear your input and to hear what you do to make it through. You can reach us on our website at ConsciousCompassion.net. We've got some amazing interviews coming up that we can't wait for you to hear. Until then, catch you next time. I'm Charles Gray. And I'm Laura Darrell. Conscious Compassion. We're, We're sharing, sharing is caring. caring.